Welcome back, FBP family, for a special episode of Thinking Ahead. Today, I welcome my co-host, Jason Stolwell, who will be chatting with John Clary. He is the Administrative Director of First Health Fitness. The theme today is how to strengthen relationships with the medical fitness community. I hope you enjoy the show. I'm your host, Dory Nugent, and every three months, we have our Thinking Ahead show that allows us to dive deeper into a topic for you. Today's Thinking Ahead episode is designed to get you thinking. We want you considering trends, movements, and ideas before they are common. This show will get you ahead of the trend curve, so please enjoy. You will hear from Jason shortly. First, a huge thank you to everyone at One Fit Stop for supporting our show. One Fit Stop is modern fitness studio software built for the growing multi-location studio, providing scheduling, client management, programming, payment collection tools, and more that will set your business up to grow, grow, grow. To find out more, go to onefitstop.com or click on the link in today's show notes. Thanks again, One Fit Stop, and make sure you check out their website, www.onefitstop.com. Get your pen ready now for Keep Me's Fit Biz Piration. Hey there, fitness business friends and family. You are going to want to get your pen and paper ready for this one. Today, I sit down with John Caleri from First Health of the Carolinas. John has received numerous awards and recognitions, including the Medical Fitness Association Director of the Year Award, the Don Schneider Award, and most recently, the 2017 Hank Boner Pioneer Award for significant contributions to the advancement of the industry. We sit down to discuss how you can better position your fitness business to build stronger relationships with local physicians and more deeply integrate our fitness industry into the greater medical wellness continuum. After Jason's interview, hang around because next week I interview Sean Turner and we talk about the Les Mills Consumer Report. I'll tell you more later. Health club leaders, you work hard to ensure your members have the very best fitness experience, right? You need personal trainers who do the same. Become a preferred partner with ISSA and we'll deliver the best trainers in the industry to your club in a matter of days, fully certified and ready to work. And we'll help you keep those trainers by offering them exclusive discounted pricing on ISSA certifications. Because when your trainers stay, so do your valued members. Becoming a preferred partner with ISSA is absolutely free. Click above or visit ISSAonline.com slash Fitbiz to get trainers now. Let's transition into the Thinking Ahead episode with my teammate, Jason Stolwell. Welcome, John. It's a pleasure to have you today. Thanks for having me, Jason. I'm excited about our talk today. Uh, me too. So I'm just going to go right into it. So can you just tell listeners a little bit more about yourself and your work with First Health? Uh, well, I came to First Health in 1995 in a part-time position as they entered the medical fitness world. I was uh, living here in, in Moore County and working down in Lumberton at Southeastern Regional Medical Center as an operations coordinator. I could not get a job full-time here, so I took a part-time job as a lifeguard. For two and a half years, I worked part-time as a lifeguard and ran another medical fitness facility uh, about an hour and 15 minutes away. And so one thing led to another. And so here I am in, that was in 1995. And in about 2001, I became the director over our facilities, over our six uh, fitness facilities for First Health. First Health is pretty early in on this medical fitness thing and have committed tremendous resources over the years to trying to help people to learn that concept of taking care of themselves so that they don't have to rely necessarily on the traditional healthcare model. They can prevent disease and treat disease as best they can with our help and expertise. Well, that's, yeah, I think we all realize, especially with the pandemic, that, you know, we need to be, you know, some of us were already moving in that direction, but we're all looking to run in that direction now which actually leads perfectly into my, my next question. So uh, a professional peer of ours from our industry recently opted to go to a medical industry conference, as opposed to a fitness industry conference. And we've all talked about how, you know, we've got to deeper integrate 
with, with that industry. But she noted that we're not even on their 10-year roadmap. They're not even thinking about uh, partnering with, with the fitness industry to improve outcomes. And so, you know, my question to you specifically is, you know, what do you think we should be doing as an industry, as individuals to build stronger relationships, maybe even more trust so that we can become a part of the whole health and wellness spectrum? I mean, I think that that's actually a huge question. We're going to answer it in a microcosm of what we've experienced here over the last uh, 12 years. OK, what it takes, because up until 12 years ago, our operation here in First Health was really viewed as a gym, right? Like kind of aren't you the guys over there in shorts playing volleyball? You're not really medical professionals, but we had an opportunity through the ACSM creation of exercises medicine to speak directly to providers and invite them to refer their patients to us. There are a lot of myths out there about what physicians will or providers will do or won't do. And one of those is they won't refer to us. They will. They just need a very specific set of instructions. They need a tremendous amount of education to know that their patients are safe with us. And they need to begin to view us as an extension of their provider visit. And it's not going to be everybody. And so it's not going to be every single provider out there is going to refer because number one, they're really not financially incentivized to do that. So it has to come from, they want to care. You know, if, if I'm a doc and Jason, you are my patient, it has to come from, I've got a guy here who's motivated and I can help him take care of himself by making this referral. The, the referral part and getting that referral to happen starts number one with education. And the education parts start with understanding that people in our industry who are properly qualified are indeed medical professionals, and they need to hold themselves out as such, rather than saying, I'm John who runs the gym. It's I'm John who runs a multi-million dollar business, and I have people on my team like Tim Smith, our clinical program manager, who has a master's in exercise science and can engage your people at a level that they're comfortable with and we can take care of your patients in a comfortable manner and achieve what honestly docs don't get this in college when they're in medical school they don't get they might have one class on exercise but what we know being in this business is most people by the time they're 40 or so they're broken somewhere and your standard run-of-the-mill exercise prescription no longer applies. And so we have to have experts who can work around that bad shoulder, bad knee, heart condition, whatever it may be. So you said a couple of there, things there that, that have triggered a couple questions I'd like to follow up with. So the, the first thing I, I wanted to, to note was um, you're totally absolutely right about doctors and their lack of knowledge in what we do. I, I've personal trained since the 90s and I've had a number of physicians and I was actually dumbfounded that they weren't sure how to train the bicep optimally. I thought that would be something that was taught in, in med right. medical school and I was uh, taken aback by how little they actually knew about what we did and, and, and the favorable outcomes uh, of different uh, lines. So I thought that was fascinating. The second part is you touched on you know, not just creating rapport, but creating professional rapport. They need to not know that, you know, John is a friendly guy, but John is a friendly guy who also does this for a living and has changed the lives of so many other people. I think that's that's such a great point. So let me ask yeah. you this. One of the things that we've noticed too is this, you know, this predominance of certifications out there, right? There's no bar exam anymore uh, or, or hasn't been a bar exam for, for personal training, for example. So can you tell me a little bit about how you feel about the certifications and the standards that we should hold our professionals to in the interest of building more trust in a stronger medical uh, wellness uh, relationship? Yeah, I think you're, you're really zeroing right in on it. So <clears throat> I'm a business guy and I had a personal training certification way back in the day, right? But I'm a business guy and I could get on, on the computer when we're done and within an hour, I could have a personal training certification 
from any one of about 150 different organizations. That's how many personal training certification organizations there are if you search it, right? So what we do is we rely on the NCCA to show what organizations are accredited, just like the college you went to, just like, you know, those include ACSM, ACE, NSCA, and I'm sure like I'm, there are about eight to 10 of them, and I'm sure that I'm leaving some out, but those are the ones that come to mind, uh, top of mind. NASM is another one. So the idea is that we rely on another agency to say this is a quality certification. And in our branch of the industry, in the medical fitness side, we will not accept any personal training certification other than that. Period. There's a period there. Right. And when you come to us, you have to have a degree and a personal training certification, or maybe you have your degree and haven't done the personal training certification. You have like three months to get it or you you don't stay employed here. And that's important. And those are the kind of things to communicate to those providers. And it can't only be from you. So we had the opportunity in 2010 as we were launching our exercises medicine program to bring in Larry Durstein, who was uh, the head of exercise science and a former, at that point, former um, president or chair of ACSM. He was the head of exercise science in South Carolina. And he came up and he spoke to the physicians about why they should be involved in this. And that was supremely influential. I also had him speak to our board of directors because we're a community run hospital system. And so he's the one who pulled them on board once he saw that we could pull off what we were saying we could pull off. Well, that's, does that make sense? That's a great suggestion because that's kind of where I was going to go with, with our next questions is, you know, how do we, you know, I have having a certified staff is one thing, but it's still, you know, the door, the gatekeeper to get in there is still, like you said, a lack of knowledge. So can you tell me a little bit about your steps that First Health has done. Um, you, we, know we're, how, we know you've gotten there, but what was those first steps like? How did you get the first physician on board? Okay, so that's a, that's a, a little bit of a long story, and we might not get to all of it, but in 2010, we had the 15th anniversary of this Pinehurst facility. So we've been open and successful for 15 years. We had not had any success with physician referral at that point at all. And there were several people across the country, several systems that were doing something. ACAC in Virginia comes to mind. Thomaston Healthcare down in Georgia comes to mind. And we grabbed little bits and pieces of what they did. And I talked to our foundation president and we brought in a guest speaker and she used that as an opportunity to hold a special event. The guest speaker was an author named Christopher McDougall, who wrote the book Born to Run, tremendously successful book, great guy. And the the take I took on it was his book was really about challenging the status quo. So he came in and we had this grouping then at one of the local country clubs because the foundation, the philanthropic, philanthropic arm of First Health was paying for this because they wanted to engage providers and top level people in our organization also. So they provided that for us. Our CEO at the time, we had designed a very simple, basic version of what we're doing now. And our CEO at the time, he said, "Uh, John, if you can get me four physicians who say that they'll support this, I'll cut you loose and just let you run. Okay. So I had my mission laid out. Talk to the foundation. This is what I want to do. Foundation was like, yep, we'll pay for this. You pay for that. No problem. So we brought Christopher McDougall in. We had an event at the one of the most prestigious country clubs in North Carolina. We fed food. It was an open bar. I had my staff working the tables as if they were car salesmen. People in our business sometimes shy away from sales, especially on the medical fitness side, but that's what we do. We created, I did a little 10 minute spiel about why this is important and what our program could look like. We had a packet for every doc that was there. There were about 30 provider or physicians. We were just doing physicians at that point. So we had about 30 physicians that attended that process. They could bring a spouse or a partner or whatever. And 
we had a packet for them. And in that packet was information about what we we're trying to do, you know, some guest passes, some other information about our programs. But most importantly, there was a little index card that we had printed up that asked three questions. Would you support this program? And there was a box to check. The second question was, would you be likely to refer people into this program? There was another box they could check. And the, and the third question was, I'd be interested in this program and I have ideas to make it better. And we had seven physicians who checked that box that they had ideas for it. Now, so I've already surpassed what the CEO required with four docs that were interested. That's all he, that's all he said, they were interested. So I already have those seven. They became our physician champions council and helped us develop the program further. And then I also had about 27 of those total 27 providers that said they would be likely to refer. Now, some of this is just simple sales technique, right? Jason, so if you think about it, there was nothing on there that said this is a stupid idea or I'll never refer. They could either not turn anything in or they could check one of the boxes. And my staff, they're pretty good at what they do. And so if Jason was there and you were a doc and you had not filled that out yet, one of my staff would be like, hey, Jason, you going to fill out that card for me, buddy? Right. So we wound up with those great results. And so once we did that, then our administration, and that's, that's maybe something that is specific to the medical fitness industry, is as part of a hospital system, I have to have administration approval to move forward with big projects, right? So through that process, we were able to do that. And we did the same thing for our physician champions group. We bring them out to a nice setting. We fed them. We, we uh, you know, there's an open bar concept going on because people relax and that's a good thing. That's what we're after. We allowed them to bring spouses and partners to it. Some of those docs back then on that council are still some of our top referrers today. So then we launched, we called it a pilot six months later. And we had to cancel the pilot about two weeks into it because we were trying to do it with just one doc and we had, 25, 30 docs who are calling us saying, hey, John, when can we refer into this program? So we canceled the pilot and just moved forward. You know, since then, we're almost to 9,000 referrals right now. And I have, I can show financials of how it makes sense, even though it's a free consultation and things like that. Wow, that's, uh, that's incredible. Those numbers are incredible. And uh, what I appreciate most about you and was really after I heard you speak a few months ago, so excited to, to interview you on the on the show today was that we all speak about you know strategy, but you have intentionality and, and implementation, a, a roadmap that a lot of us could actually follow in our own areas to try to build these relationships. So I really, you know, I, I can't tell you how how appreciative I know I am and I'm sure uh, owners and operators listening to the show now uh, feel the same way. So, so let me ask you, so the next steps of that. So now you've got the physicians in the, in, in the system. How do we draw the referral now? Is it an automatic referral or is it something that the doctor gives the patient a note and then the patient who becomes the member to you? Like, how does that next step of the relationship go from doctor visit to referral? Yeah, so between 2010, when we launched the program, And late 2019, we kind of bumped along, I would say, at between 40 and 70 referrals a month. There's a lot of work that went into that. So we did not have a clinical program manager at the time, who is now Tim Smith, who I mentioned earlier. Uh, So myself and our program manager, Carrie Garbark, we spent a lot of time on the local speaking circuit, right? So whether it was a church group or it was at a physician's practice or it was a civic club like the Rotary or the Lions Club, whatever. We took every opportunity we could to get out. And that's a really important part for your listeners to understand. The referrals aren't always generated by the doc. And you have to think about, like, put yourself in the doc's position. They have somewhere between five and 10 minutes to meet with you. They have to cover what's most important for you 
to make sure that they're taking care of you and doing appropriate care. And so we may not be on their top of mind. And we're going to circle back to that concept in a little bit. But so what we found early on in this program was about 90% of our referrals came from someone in the public hearing about it, understanding it, and taking a referral form that we had hand out or we have handed out, or we have, we have them available on our website, and going to their doc and saying, Dr. Jason, I want you to refer me to this program. Now, what, what doc wouldn't do that? And that's what we ran into. You know, yeah. I had one doc turn us down and we turned him into a regular referrer once he understood what we were doing. Wow. Uh, I mean, again, wow. So, so that's, you, 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 you put it right in the, in the statement. So how do we become part of their mind share? And, and you, like you said, you only get, you know, medical wellness, almost like a doctor is almost like the puppy mill, right? You're in, you're out the next patient's like right there. So right. how do we stay in the mind share of a solution that they would recommend? Like, how do you, how do you build that, that not just trust, but forefront of this is your clear next steps. You need to meet John at First Health. Yeah. So first of all, just in case anybody from First Health administration ever watches this, I did not use the term puppy mill. That was Jason. Let's just clarify. They're really clear. <laughs> I'm going to edit that out later. Yeah. <laughs> so, so anyway, the top of the mind part is the hardest thing because it's extremely labor intensive unless you have some sort of automated process. And this really brings us in our, in our history, brings us to 2020. So early spring 2020, something happened here in this country that changed the fitness industry a lot with, the, with COVID. But what we wound up doing during that time is we got connected to our electronic medical record. We were, we were just listed as a program. There was nothing to drive anybody to that. It was just listed as a program that the provider had to understand we were there and they could go find us and refer an appropriate patient, right? So after about a year of that, we uh, probably six months, we realized our referrals weren't going up. So we were still in that 40 to, at that time, it was probably 40 to 60 referrals a month. And it was a little bit frustrating, to be honest, because we thought, well, we've cracked this nut. We're on the electronic medical record. And so every first health physician ought to be referring to us. And it just did not happen. So we talked with, we use Epic as an electronic medical record. And so you'll hear me refer to Epic often, but all electronic medical records that I know of have a similar process. So we went to our Epic team and we said, we want to make automatic referral to this program for people who meet certain diagnoses. And our, uh, we have a, a doctor, Dr. Wilson, she's actually one of our uh, physician champions. And she was like, whoa, whoa, you can't say automatic referral, John. Then you're taking the power of medical prescription away from the provider. And that was important for me to understand because I don't necessarily speak their language because I haven't done everything that they've done. So I, I spoke then at that point with the, with the Epic team and said, is there something like this? And we had a tremendous young lady from, uh, from our IT department named Meredith who said, well, there's something called the best practice advisory. And so, you know, we eventually launched that in April of 2021. But what the best practice advisory is, if you think about your own work on a computer, uh, which all, all docs are running computers now, right? So when we, we, we put a team together to do this and the doc who was on the team, Dr. Gillum said, hey, we should focus on just overweight and obese diagnoses. So every diagnosis that you get at the physician has a grouping. And so those are two groupings, obese is one and overweight is another one. And that's primarily driven by BMI. So all those, all that data is being collected when you go in and your and your uh, providers put in information. And he wanted that, and I think this is important for our industry to know. You know, your listeners know, and I know we can treat or 
prevent 80% of chronic diseases in America with a healthy ex with exercise and healthy eating and other positive healthy lifestyle habits. But the provider world st still looks at us as a gym to go lose weight. So we said, let's, let's meet them where they are rather than trying to wrestle them over the wall to understand that we can take care of a bunch of your maladies at the same time. So what happens, let's say I go into the uh, provider and think about the niceness, the, the, the good thing we're doing for the provider here. So I go in and my BMI shows up and, uh, and my BMI is too high. And that provider gets to say to me, uh, well, what I'm sorry, what happens on the provider screen is a pop-up comes up, just like happens on your computer. Now, that provider cannot move past that pop-up unless they click refer or don't refer. So every time that diagnosis goes in, that pops up. What we just did for the provider is a couple things. The first, and to your point, is that we became top of mind for them because they don't have a choice. So it pops up in front of them and they have to say yes or no, right? The second thing we did, instead of my provider saying, hey, John, you're fat and we need to do something about it, without a referral to go anywhere, right? He says, John, I think this is going to be a good plan for you. I'm going to refer you to the exercise and medicine program. If the doc will do that, we have a tremendously higher level of participation from those patients. If the doc will just say a simple sentence like that, right? If they refer and don't say anything, people are very resistant when we call. But if they know it's coming, they're open to the concept at least, or at least they know it's coming. So, you know, the last thing that we've done is if you're a doc and you put in an obese diagnosis, you're required really by CMS regulations to counsel that patient on that diagnosis. So in this case, it would require my doc to say, John, you're fat. Well, that's great. Thank you very much. I already knew that. You need to do something about that. And so then the doc gets out of their scope, not really talking about what they're experts at, number one. And then number two, they're going to burn 20 to 30 seconds of that five-minute time talking about the fact that John's fat. And instead of doing that, they can click this and say, John, I've referred you to exercises medicine. You're going to get a phone call from them. And it would be good for you if you go. And he doesn't even need to address it, <laughs> right? That doc doesn't even need to address it. And you know what it counts as when they hit that referral? It counts as their counseling session. Because when they come to us, we document an epic. This is what John came on this date. This is what we talked about. And so the counseling happens. And in that way, and speaking about the language that providers use, in that way, we are an extension of the provider visit when people come and do that free consultation. I feel like everyone listening to this show needs to get your address and send you some type of licensing, uh, you know, uh, thank you fee, because I mean, you really just laid out the roadmap. Um, so you, you said earlier too, about, you know, let's not wrestle them over the wall. I think that's a great point. So the, your first steps were to narrow down to very specific diagnoses codes and become the top of the mind share for those, and then grew the relationship from there, right? So, so obese would be an example of the first steps for listeners is let's just work to be the obese recommendation for how to address that provider for the physicians. Is that correct? That is correct. And that okay. came from, you know, one of our first health primary care docs who served on our team to try and get this launched. And, he, and that was him. And, uh, you know, Dr. Gillum, I give him all the credit for that because we were, we were where the rest of the medical fitness industry is right now. And they're saying, we need to do diabetes. We need to do high blood pressure. We need to do this and that. And the reality is most of these people, if you're obese or you're overweight, you're going to have those issues anyway, but it doesn't matter if the doc won't, won't refer their patient to you, right? If you can't get the people in the door, it doesn't matter what diagnosis you use. So let's meet them where they are. The so, provider. Is. So that's, a genius move getting to the pop-up because I said you, you don't even necessarily need to worry about being the top of the mind share because now they're confronted with that moment where they have to choose to refer or not refer 
just a genius stroke. And then I like how you said that it becomes the the consultation because you document it on your end in Epic. Um, right. So I, if you don't mind myself, I'm not a swimmer. Maybe our listeners may be or maybe not, but I want to ask. So can you tell us a little bit about Epic? Is this something that we could go out and, and, and start uh, building relationships with, with our own uh, facilities? Or how did you get to this, this point to be able to build into the system? Okay, so Epic is an electronic medical record. Every hospital and physician's office and all that surgery center, everything across the United States is required by law to have electronic medical record keeping. Um, that was part of the Affordable Care Act. I don't know when it actually hit, but everybody's on an EMR of one sort or another now. If you're a private operator or a YMCA, or anybody that's not directly affiliated with that healthcare system that you're trying to attract, you won't get access to Epic. But that doesn't mean, or the EMR, right? Because there are others out there. That doesn't mean you can't work with the team at your healthcare organization and say, let's replicate this. And while our referral system comes straight over Epic to us, to Tim Smith, who I've mentioned a bunch of times now, directly, all those EMRs have the ability to send emails or faxes with the exact same information. And, you know, faxes may be a thing of the past in the rest of the world, but in healthcare, they still exist because they're a secure way to send information. And even right here in Pinehurst, North Carolina, with you still a relatively small town, within three miles of where I'm sitting right now, there are five different EMRs in use that don't talk to each other. So if they're not a first health physician, they have to fax or email. Incredible. Uh, so obviously, I, that's, I've got three pages of notes. And I think we've been speaking for 18 minutes. I, I got to re-watch immediately after I, uh, we've done this. So, so to start to wrap up, I have two questions. One, what is first steps that owners, operators, managers can take from this. So we've listened to the show, you've got us all fired up to change the world. What would be the very first step that you would recommend that we, we follow through with? The first step is you have to design a program that will work for your facility. I think there are a couple key things there. The, the first is um, you have to remove barriers. So remember, we're, we're not targeting the fit people of the world with this. We're targeting people who are not and likely never have been regular active gym users, which is a great business model if you think about it, because 80% of the population is out there wallowing in need for physical activity. So we need to remove as many barriers as you can to get them in the door. That's why our first consultation, our 30-minute consultation is at no charge. So you, you put out 30 minutes of labor in the hopes then of recouping that from membership. So our average length of membership in our first health facilities right now is 68 months, 68 months. So think about that return on investment. If I pay Tim half an hour of his salary to sit down with Jason and Jason becomes a member who's likely to stay for five plus years, that seems like a pretty good deal from an investment standpoint, right? So you got to make that easy. The second group you have to make it easy for are the providers. They need a seamless system to get the information to you and they don't want to touch it after that until you circle back with them, right? So we circle back and say, Jason has came to his consultation. Jason has joined the facility. Jason has joined our eight week program to get started. These are his goals. Very, very simple information back and forth. But the just like we talked about earlier, the providers have so much going on that we need to make it easy for them. We need to relieve them of burden, not try and create more burden for them. So I, I'm almost leery to, to ask you how listeners can contact you because I believe your, your inbox is going to get flooded the moment after the show goes live. But what would be the best way for those who want to learn more or touch base with you? What's the best way for them to get in contact with you, sir? Yeah, so I hope um, I hope that you have the ability when you when you put this out there to, to put it in writing. But it's jkaliri at firsthealth.org. 
So it's J-C-A-L-I-R-I at F-I-R-S-T-H-E-A-L-T-H dot org. Or that was pretty good, right? You're laughing. You know, it was great. Yeah. Be able to make it. It'll, it'll uh, certainly be in the show notes after the show. Yeah, they, Jason, they can also call me at 910-715-1836. And I'm, I'm happy to deal that way also. Yeah, I, yeah you give freely uh, to help better us all uh, and, and outcomes. I can't, again, I, I'm so impressed with just the manner in which you conduct yourself pres- professionally. Like I was ecstatic for this, this talk, sir. So uh, is there any last comments or notes or anything you'd like to relate to listeners um, before we, we wrap? Uh, no, I, I just would, I guess I'll just say it's not as hard as people make it out to be. And providers are eager for an outlet to help their patients. That's why they all became providers to start with, because they want to care for people. And this is your opportunity to be part of it, really. Wow. Again, I can't thank you enough for coming on the show today. And I look forward to hearing how uh, how big your inbox got right after uh, we go live. Sounds good. Thanks, Jason. Appreciate the opportunity. Yes, sir. Did you know that the active ingredient in most disinfecting wipes has well-documented lung, skin, and reproductive health concerns? That active ingredient is called a quaternary ammonium compound, or a quat, not necessarily something you'd want in a health and wellness facility. VaporFresh disinfecting gym wipes avoid all quats and instead use an innovative citric acid chemistry to disinfect. Even with this greener chemistry, VaporFresh is still EPA-registered to disinfect 99.9% of surfaces. VaporFresh is trusted by some of the most premier gyms and college recs centers nationwide. With 1,200 wipes per roll and four rolls per case, they offer an unbeatable value per wipe. Order today at VaporFresh.com or Amazon. Quick Fire 5. Please welcome Sean Turner, the CEO of Les Mills U.S. Now, let's find out more about Sean and why our FBP family needs to tune in next week. I have Sean Turner with us. He is the CEO of Les Mills US. Sean, welcome to the quick fire five questions where we're going to get to learn a couple things about you. Hi, thank you for having me and uh, looking forward to it. All right, let's start with question number one, and that is what is a life lesson that you have learned from the pandemic? Okay, I think it's a reset of how valuable quality time is with family, friends, and people in general. I think we've been isolated for quite a while. Um, so we've got to learn that, but also it sheds lights on, on how busy we are when we're not in the pandemic and are traveling and really busy with our business life. So that's an important one for me. And hopefully I'll, I'll be better in that space going forward. <laughs> Fantastic. And our Second question is, if you could be a character in any movie, what character would it be and why? I think you've got to go for some kind of superhero type thing here. I would say I'd go for Professor Charles Xavier from X-Men. And the reason is, is because he's telepathic and that would be a pretty useful tool (laughs) to have. So, yeah, I'd say him. I think he's also devoted to bettering other people, <laughs> mutants, but whatever. <laughs> um, he comes across as uh, pretty intelligent and uh, compassionate and pretty down to earth. So, yeah, he's a cool dude. All right, a cool dude he is. I like that. You selected a cool dude for yourself. Fantastic. All right, please complete this statement for me. Sunday morning, you can find me. Sunday morning, you can find me watching. English Premier League soccer, usually, because of the time difference, it's early in the morning in the United States. So get it out of the day early and don't waste the rest of the day, I guess. Okay. And what is one book that you could recommend to all of our FBP family out there? What are you reading or what have you read lately that you have really enjoyed that you'd like to share with everybody? I I actually often recommend this book. I've read it a long time ago, but I've recently got good feedback from someone I recommended to, and it's a book called The Four Agreements. You might know it. It's by a guy called Don Miguel Ruiz. It's very simple, 
but it's really powerful and there's some great life lessons in there. So I'd recommend that. And it's quite an easy read and right. ideas that are quite powerful. All right. We'll take that one. That is a first for the fitness business podcast. So we love when there are, when there are uh, new books that people are sharing with us. All right. Are you ready to give your best elevator pitch on why our listeners should come back next week to hear your episode? Uh, sure. I'll have a go. Yeah, please join me next week when I'll share key insights from our 2021 Global Fitness Report that we've recently done. We interviewed over 12,000 people across seven countries, and it's got some great insight into how we win in the new age of fitness. All right. Well, I know all of our listeners out there are definitely trying to figure out how to win in the new age of fitness. So please, everybody come back next week. It is Sean Turner. He is the CEO of Les Mills U.S. I hope you enjoyed today's show with Jason and John. I want to personally thank you for joining us today. And if you would like to contact John for more information, then please head to our show notes at www.fitnessbusinesspodcast.com. I would like to thank our founding partner, Active Management, our partners, Keep Me, My Zone, Discover Strength, Tribe Team Training, One Fit Stop, and ISSA, as well as our advertisers, Rex Roundtables, MX Metrics, and Vapor Fresh. We believe what you leave behind is not what is engraved in stone monuments, but woven into the lives of others. <laughs>